Well, hi, I'm Tim. Um, really happy to be here today, and I obviously recognize that it's 4 p.m. and you guys have been in the conference hall all day and probably have a few drinks on your mind, maybe some Ignite. So we have an hour, but I will um, not take the whole hour, and I want to make sure to leave some time for discussion afterwards, much like Nate did, and have some Q&A and, and back and forth if we can. So. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm Tim, last name's Falls, so you can find me at Tim Falls on Twitter if you want to get in touch anytime. Um, just want to give you a little bit of background on who I am, where I'm coming from, and hopefully that'll shed some light on why I'm up here talking to you guys. So I grew up in the cornfields of Indiana, right across the Ohio River, um, down in the Evansville area, and went to Indiana University. So not, not totally unfamiliar here with, with Cincinnati. I have some friends friends who live here and have visited a couple of times. Um, from Indiana, I made my way out to Boulder, Colorado, which, I, which is currently my home, and a uh, few more mountains, a few less cornfields. Um, beautiful place, so if any of you are ever there, make sure to, to hit me up on Twitter and I'll show you the hiking trails. Um, once I made it to Boulder, I was in grad school and I discovered this little, little organization called Techstars. It's a seed stage accelerator. I'm sure you guys, uh, many of you have heard of it before. Um, started in Boulder and is now a, a global organization. Um, I was just an intern there working with 10 different startups and that was my introduction to tech and startups and this whole, whole crazy world that we all live in today. Um, from there, I got a job at SendGrid. SendGrid was uh, one of the startups that were being, was being accelerated in the program at the time and uh, got to really know the co-founders by working for free for them, which seems to be uh, the best way to find a, a good startup to work with. And, uh, and now, as, as you heard, I'm, I'm the community guy. So I lead a team of developer evangelists who are based across the US and uh, one guy in London right now, we're building out a, an international, the international side of things. So uh, developer evangelist is, is kind of a, a new position that, that many tech firm, tech companies um, are, are introducing into their, their organizational chart. And a lot of people have no idea what it is. Uh, a lot of, like when my parents heard that, they were like, oh, I didn't know you were religious, but uh, I'm not, actually. That's just a new title. And if that's something you guys want to talk about, that I'd be, be happy to, to um, you know, cover that in the Q&A. Uh, what is that all about? Why does it matter to companies and community and peop um, specifically companies who are doing APIs and, and trying to build communities around developers? Um, so SendGrid is an internet email company, uh, more so on the email, but uh, dependent on the internet. And I'm not going to go too far into that, uh, the email part of things, but we're a, we're a startup kind of transitioning into a grown-up company. We're, uh, we started in 2009, and we're now about 130 employees. We send, we have about a little over 100,000 customers, including folks like um, Pinterest and Tumblr and Spotify. And we're sending about 7 billion emails a month for those folks. But like I said, I won't go too far into that because tomorrow, if you're in the workshops, my friend Elmer here, who's in the front row, is going to talk more about email. So um, that's a little bit about me, and hopefully that sheds some light on like why I'm up here talking to you all. And we're going to talk, uh, but sorry, I want to I want to give you a little bit more. SendGrid is kind of what I get paid for and what I, my day and night and weekend job, but there's a lot of other things that I do because I'm passionate about community, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So I founded a company called boulderbeta.co, uh, which is really just an entity behind an event called Boulder Beta that's a startup event that we do uh, a few times a year, bring in 10 startups, showcase them in a bar, very casual social environment in downtown Boulder and have a few hundred people come in. Um, besides that, I, I contributed recently a, a very small portion to a book called Startup Communities by Brad Feld, kind of based on the Boulder thesis. Um, Nate earlier talked a lot about New York and I could kind of say that he was giving you the New York thesis. Um, but I wanted to mention that because I do pull a lot from Brad's 
content and, and just having read that. So I'd really encourage you guys to, to read that if you have a chance. And I actually have a few copies um, to give away if anybody would like one, is interested in, in picking one up afterwards, be happy to give you one. And if we run out, I can, I can mail a few out for you guys. Um, other than that, I'm also, uh, I help, in, help organize the thing called Open Angel Forum, which is a community event in Boulder where we bring a bunch of angel investors together, put them in a room with some select startups and hopefully make matches. Um, and, and finally, sometimes I'm a geek on a plane. Um, there's, a, there's a group called 500 Startups. It's a, an accelerator and venture fund out of Silicon Valley. Dave McClure, you might recognize the name of. And basically, they take a group of geeks to some region of the world about four times per year, and they get totally ingrained within that startup community. And they learn about you know, what are the problems, what are the challenges, what are the good things and the bad things going on in those communities, and help um, kind of bring a little bit of Silicon Valley to each of those uh, communities and, and get involved and, and really just get a feel for what's going on internationally. Uh, so all this really boils down to myself and the people I work with are helping make community happen. Uh, so community is a pretty, pretty generic term. Um, we've already heard, it talk, heard Nate talk about community today, and I don't want to rehash what he's already spoken about, but there, I, I think what I'm going to deliver today uh, in, the next, in the next few minutes will really supplement and complement what Nate's already spoken about, and hopefully um, speak generally enough about community so that you all can apply it to your specific situations, but specifically enough about communities so that you can walk away with something tangible and actionable uh, so you all can, if you so desire, you know, take a next step to help Cincinnati in the area, or if you're from outside of, outside of the city, um, you know, help your local communities be better. And I think also, at the same time, um, when we're talking about community, it's important to make a distinction or, or recognize the different levels at which community exists. If, uh, if you have a startup, there's a community around your startup, right, or, or even a, around your product or your API, but then there's also the geographical sense of the community. And then within geographies, there's many different ones. So um, that's kind of the, the angle from which I'm coming. Uh, so how do you make community happen or help do so? Well, one thing is you go places. Uh, you meet people, and um, you know. So traveling around the world, or traveling around your region, or traveling around your state is important. And the meeting people is really important. Um, and because once you meet people, then you're able to build relationships. And relationships are what really hold and glue together a community. Um, but ultimately, once you go those places, meet those people, and build those relationships, what uh, what I really do is connect dots. And what I mean by connecting dots is once you recognize and appreciate like who you're working with or who you're talking to or who you're connecting with, um, the community, the, the act of building community happens when you connect dots between that person and another person that, that they should talk to, that they should know. So from specifically from the SendGrid standpoint, if I meet someone who's a customer and they're having problems, I put them immediately in touch with, with support so they can get their problem solved. If, uh, if they're a customer and they have product feedback, I get them in touch with the right people within our company so that they can provide that feedback and guide our, our future product development. Um, and likewise, if, they, if it's a business-related um, you know, partnership or sale, you, know, you just, it's, you have to be able to understand the other person's perspective and know where other people are in their, from their specific perspectives and know where the, where the dots need to be connected and make those connections. But, so that's, that's enough about me. I want to get, uh, get into the important part, which is you. Um, Cincinnati, from what I, what I gather so far, is an awesome place, and it's, it has a lot of potential, and a lot of things are happening here. And based on the reaction uh, of, from Nate's talk, it sounds like people are really motivated to make things happen. So um, 
that's what I that's what I want to talk about and, and hopefully provide you with at the end of this talk uh, some some way to uh, make the merge part of QC merge really happen. Um, so we've already we've already established the fact that that's that's what we're talking about, and hopefully um, we can guide this in a direction that'll be uh, complementary and supplementary to what we've already heard today. So I want to start with uh, a story that I find pretty intriguing, and I'm, I'm going to use the baseball or the sports reference, and hopefully you guys will, will relate to it, especially since we're going out to see the Reds tomorrow. So this, this slide shows you uh, a, a snapshot of what was called a big red machine, which is the Cincinnati Reds in the 1970s. They were a force to be reckoned with. They were uh, the best team in baseball in the 1970s. They won uh, div divisional titles five years. They won league pennants four years. They won two World Series. They had an awesome manager in Sparky Anderson, also an awesome name. They had great players like Pete Rose and Joe Morgan and uh, Johnny Bench, Hall of Famers. And they did amazing things. They had like I said, they, all, they won all those titles, but there was one year in that decade where things didn't work out. They had a losing record one year, and that's really the important year to take note of. Um, so you might be wondering, why the hell is this guy standing up in front of us telling us about the Cincinnati Reds? He's not even from Cincinnati. For all we know, he might be a Cardinals fan, which... Okay, I really liked Ozzie Smith when I was a little kid, and I love the cars, but I'll be rooting for the Reds tomorrow. Um, so yeah, why, why am I up here talking about this? What the hell does baseball have to do with startup communities or startups in general? Well, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from that, that big red machine, and most importantly, the failure of, of that one year which is very akin to a failure of a startup or the failure of a, a bad hire or a bad fit uh, within your startup. And that's where lessons can be learned. So I want to translate that lesson into startups and communities and, and move forward with that. So everybody in this room, each individual, has strengths, weaknesses, skills, experience, expertise, abilities, um, but held captive, those abilities and skills have no power. They do nothing. However, if you set those, if, you, if you're aware of those abilities and you collectively and as a community together make, like, recognize those abilities and, and uh, and skills and interests and passions, and you make those very well known to the rest of the community, then all those passions intermingle and they, they work together and amazing things happen and things take flight. So moving on with the, the uh, baseball analogy, baseball teams, you know, they have nine, nine, per, nine people on the field at, at any given time, right? Each one of those nine people has his, his own or her own special capability. There are the pitchers, and within the pitchers there are closers and there's starters, and there's aces. There are the outfielders and the infielders on the defense. There are gold glovers, and there are guys who are on defense just because they got a good bat. There are um, really fast people who can steal bases, and others that not so fast, and you want to keep them slow. Just like that, startup communities have players, and each of those players has its own strength and weakness, both on an organizational level and on, a, on an individual level. And the players in Cincinnati are, you know, well-rounded. You have organizations and meetups like the, uh, or events, I should say, like the Cincinnati Lean Startup Meetup, you have Cincinnati Startup Weekend that happens every once in a while. Then you have organizations and groups like Girl Develop It who are teaching things. You have uh, government groups who are providing you know, that, that in infrastructural support for, for uh, businesses and entrepreneurs. 
You have other places like the Brandery and Launch Factory who are providing an environment for innovation and entrepreneurs to thrive. You have supporters like angel investors who power that financially. And then you have individuals and startups who represent the company and put or represent the community and put the community on the map and come back as speakers at events and get funding and, and get TechCrunch articles written about them who, that then filters back to the community. So um, Nate touched on something. He, he, he mentioned the roles. And I want to compliment his, his distinction of those different roles with another thing that Brad points out. And it's really two categories of people that kind of also encompass those roles. So there are feeders in the community. Feeders include um, kind of what, what, uh, what Nate was talking about on one side of the roles, which is government, there's universities, there's investors, there's mentors, service providers, and larger companies. And these are the people who provide and the organizations who provide the food for the leaders. And the leaders are who make shit happen. The leaders are entrepreneurs. So the very first thing is not only know your role, as Nate said, but also dig down a little deeper and uh, understand that you know, those roles, A, are your choice. So if you find yourself as a feeder today and you want to be a leader, you can change that, and vice versa. Um, but it's important to recognize where you where you where you land and act accordingly. So if you're an entrepreneur, be a leader, make shit happen. If you're a feeder, as Nate said, kind of take that back seat, provide the fuel, and let the doers do what they do. <clears throat> so take it even one step further down the chain. Know who are you within the leaders, for example. Are you a builder? Do you write code? Um, or through in the feeders category, are you selling stuff? Are you a product person? Are you a marketer? Are you an idea person? Do you come up with those ideas and then go find those builders and get them on board and, 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 and put your passion into them and get them to build something that you think is going to change the world? Or are you a person with money? And if so, are you a VC or are you an angel? What is your, what is your approach to dispersing that money? Or maybe you're a badass and you do everything, and there are those people. And if you're really lucky, and I'm sure that there's a few in the room, you're really good at making chili. <laughs> Cincinnati chili for that. Um, so no matter where you fall in there, it's just really important to be aware. And not only to be aware, for yourself, but to make everybody else in the community aware so that as you're going out and you're, you're coming up with ideas and you're trying to get stuff done, you know where to go. Um, and with this transparent network of communication, all those dots become much more easy to connect. And the solution or the startup that you're trying to build is, is that much closer. And the circle, the full circle comes much more easily. And you get to where you're trying to you accomplish your goal in a much more um, straightforward manner. So why does all this matter? Why am I telling you this? Well, there's a whole lot of benefits that come from taking this approach, from communicating, from making yourself known in the community, making yourself available in the community as an individual or as an organization. Um, on, a, on a micro level, you are gaining benefits, um, gaining benefits like just immediate recognition um, from from the from your region or from other people in the in the community. You're uh, you're you're creating an environment for inclusion and acceptance and uh, an openness and productivity, right? And on a more macro level, once those benefits start rolling and things are really getting going and they, you, know, you give it time to gel, then on a more macro level, startups are succeeding. More, 
more talent is being attracted to the, to the community from outside. Uh, there's a boom in economic activity and the region is better and you're known on a regional, national and global scale as a place where startups can happen and entrepreneurs can succeed and people want to be there. So, um, and, and on, along those lines, one, one really important thing to remember in this, uh, and Brad does a really good job of expressing this through the book as well, is that startup communities are not a short-term thing. Um, there has to be people, members of the community, who are in it for the long haul, who are going to be here 20 years from now. And every year, you should think, where, you know, am I going to be here? Am I going to be one of those feeders or one of those leaders 20 years from now? It's not a five-year thing. It doesn't happen overnight. You can have short-term, you, you can have people who come in for a few years or who have grown up here and, you know, make it and, and move on to somewhere else. You can have people who come in for just a few years and do their thing and then leave. But there has to be some stability. There has to be people who, who stick around and who see it through. So, now that we know there's benefits, I want to I pose to you that you do one thing in the next two weeks. And this is, this is a challenge from me to everybody in the room. And that one thing is sit down with a colleague or a peer or a friend or a group of them and have a discussion that's structured in this way. Download, discuss, and decide, and then do. So download amongst the group or with your peer, what, whoever you're speaking with. What it, after you've done that self-evaluation, download like who you are, what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, and what you can do. And then discuss back and forth, based on that download, what is it that I might be able to contribute back to this community? What is it that I could do within the next two weeks, at least get the ball rolling, to make things better for me and the rest of the community? It could be really big. It could be jumping on board with QC Merge and helping make this conference bigger and better next year. It could be really small by attending next week's Ruby meetup. It could be somewhere in the middle and uh, you know, starting a mailing list or putting up a website or volunteering your design time on weekends to startups who need it, or doing office hours to provide mentorship and advisement. Whatever it is, decide it within the next two weeks, and then do it. And whoever it is that you sit down with, make them hold you accountable. And you, as the person who's sitting down with, with your peer, hold them accountable, and vice versa. If one does, the other one will. And one quote from from Brad's book that I think was really telling and, and kind of got me going was, if not us, who? And if not now, when? And it's self-explanatory, you know? If everybody sits on their hands and says, you know, somebody else will do it, then shit doesn't get done. If everybody or even half the people say, okay, us and now, then shit will get done. Also, one more thing, I think you should read the book. Um, I was talking to Nate earlier and he said, man, I feel like a total asshole because I haven't read that book yet. And I really do think, um, you know, I get no royalties, I can tell you that much, but I think it's, it's an incredible book. And even though I live in Boulder and I know the Boulder thesis, it was like, you know, it just got the juices flowing and it really made me think. And I think that anybody who finds this topic interesting and is remotely inspired by wanting to make a difference, will enjoy that and really benefit from the, from the read. So if, if that happens, see if I can advance here, the merge part of QC Merge will happen. If everybody commits or a portion of you commit and we have a trickle down effect throughout the community, things will be good. High fives will ensue and perhaps the next big red machine in Cincinnati will be a big red startup machine. Not to say that we don't want the reds coming back to, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what I think could happen if everybody does their part. And 
with that, I'd love to take any questions that you have and have a little conversation around anything that I just talked about or anything unrelated, whatever you have. Thanks. All right, am I live? Hey, thanks, Tim, for, uh, for the presentation. And I'm going to be the microphone monkey, so if you have questions, uh, raise your hand and I'll come to you. Are we communityed out? <laughs> anyone? Anyone? You know, we. I'll, I will go ahead. And I do have a couple of questions. There you go, Doug. I, I don't. I don't mind stepping up. <laughs> so both with uh, both with yours and the other talk about community. There's a lot of emphasis on startups. Um, and I dig startups. I kind of, to be honest, I actually have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with startups. I love what they do. I love the innovation. I love the excitement. Um, I love the notoriety that comes uh, with them. And, you know, we have uh, some startups here today. I think I saw the Road Tripper guys here and, uh, and some of the others who are Brandery graduates and whatnot. But I also have, you know, it's, it's, it's a struggle to work with startups because their budget is so tight, right? And so on the one hand, I really want to focus and build up the startup community of Cincinnati. At the same time, I also want to feed my four kids and, you know, prepare for college for those four kids and that kind of thing. And so I wonder what the balance is there between focusing on startups and also the broader, commu the broader tech community than just the startup community. Well, it certainly has to involve like the community and the business. Let's let's take the word startup and replace it with business. The business community, and and even if it's not business related, there's there's tons of of things of activities that are happening out there that are community based. Whether it's you know book clubs or cooking groups or ball teams, recreational softball, whatever it is, all of that requires money and it requires people and it requires time, right? And, um, you know, in the case of a softball team, you're depending on the individual's contribution. Uh, in the case of a conference like this, you're depending on the individuals who value it enough to, to come and pay money to be here, as well as you know, startups and larger companies who do have funds to make that happen. Um, so it requires a little bit from everybody. It requires the big companies to recognize who they are, where they've been, and how they got to where they are, and empathize with the startups while also keeping a smart business mind uh, on their uh, business brain in, in their heads. So, as a, are you coming from a perspective of, you know, a larger company who wants to support startups or just an individual who, uh... Kevin says we're a startup, but I don't think that's true actually. <laughs> uh, what, here, here's what I, here's, this is my whole motivation on Cincinnati, and I mentioned this last year at this conference as well, and this is work that we've been doing, I think a lot of people have been doing, not just myself. I get tired of hearing about people who say, oh, I want to do interesting things, and so I'm moving to San Francisco, Boulder, New York, Boston, or Austin, or any, you name your city, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I want Cincinnati to be a place where interesting things happen and where tech is thriving. And I think, I think everyone in this room wants that. So how can we promote that type of a community without quitting our jobs and going on starvation wages mm -hmm. to build interesting things. I want to see interesting things being built, and I want to support that the best way I can. And I'm not exactly sure, because um, we're talking about in communities and talking about like the New York Tech Group, uh, Tech Meetup, there's a lot of focus on startups, and I understand that. How do we foster that while still not living on, you know, minimum wage? Yeah. I think it gets back to the message of give before you get. 
And it's just as much on the startup's plate as anyone else's to do that. To, you know, they might not have money to pay for a lawyer or uh, pay exorbitant prices for certain web services, but they have sweat equity and they have the ability to contribute something back. So every single member should be giving before they're getting. And if that's not happening, then it's broken and you're not gonna see success. If people aren't willing to give before they get back, then it's not gonna work. And that, that's, that's it. across and the board, right? That's, that's across the board saying. at every level. So entrepreneurs, if they don't if they don't have money, what do they have to give? And that's usually time. And that's uh, you know when it gets when I come back to like decide one thing that you can contribute. That's where the big or small it doesn't really matter. Just find something. And collectively, if everybody gives the minimum amount of what they can, collectively that turns into a huge thing and it will work for everyone. So as a more established company who has, has plenty of revenue and has funding, uh, you know, from the SendGrid perspective, that's kind of where we find ourselves now. Three years ago, we were the, the team with no money and no revenue and no customers. And what we gave at that point was uh, our time. So we'd go out in the community, our founders, our early employees, we would be out there and we would be sharing our stories and sharing our experiences and hopefully helping other entrepreneurs um, do better. At the same time, we were getting a lot too. So we got free counsel from lawyers uh, and so on and so forth. But once, once we got to the point where we raised $5 million, we were paying those lawyers. And that, that volunteerism that, the, that, that they gave us through legal counsel and when they weren't charging us $500 an hour, came back in spades whenever you know, we saw that success and we were able to pay. And when you get, you know, you're giving at one level on one side, but then once you are able to give something else and you have already taken, you will give, you know, you will adjust what your give is. So, when all we have is time, we give time. When we have time and money, we give both, and it, and it snowballs. So, um, you know, it, it kind of comes back to, to that, knowing who you are, what you have to give, and just being aware and giving what you can, and not trying to give too much. Uh, that's a good answer, I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, other comments? Over there, Josh, I'll be there. We need audio. It's for the video. Posterity. <laughs> Is that what's going on with our government? No. Oh. That's austerity. I'm just kidding. So, and I, I, I would love to get a copy of your book. That's really what I was asking for. But right. uh, beyond that, could you glean some top-level thoughts about like what Boulder has done that you didn't present in your presentation that Cincinnati could learn from? I, obviously, we know that Boulder is awesome in um, so many ways that would obviously make people want to go live there. And so th this has been like a pretty big issue in Cincinnati. There was like this article not too terribly long ago where the founder of a, um, a company here in town who shall remain nameless said, mis misspoke a bit and let's just say he inflamed probably a lot of people in this room a little bit about like um, driving town elsewhere and everyone's like, you know, I'm here, right? You know, like th we actually have a great, great community here. There's, mm -hmm. all, there's lots of reasons to be here, but what else can we learn too? Because I. I think that you can always get like flummoxed by the, you know, what's going on in your head. Oh, we're awesome, but we're not obviously marketing ourselves as well as we could to bring people here, to get talent mm -hmm. here and to like make, make it obvious, make it known by all the powers that be. Yeah. So that, you know, for example, pe people like that don't feel like they have to go and open up a San Francisco office to yeah. get the and job done. Yeah, we can certainly empathize with that. I mean, we have our fair share of Silicon Valley flea for those who are successful, whether it's on an individual founder basis and starts a small company, gets acquired, you know, wants to do his next one and goes to San Francisco, or, um, or the company itself grows up and they're like, well, we're, we're big kids now and we, we're going out to Silicon Valley. Um, so we can definitely relate to, I guess if, if you want to say combat that, um, 
it's just you roll with the punches, really, and you you know and you feel confident that you know we do have the people that are required to make this happen. People come and go, right? You're never going to have the same exact set of people in a community. And, and if they go, they might come back. And they can still contribute, even if they do go. Um, so some of the things that, that Boulder has done to, uh, to get to where it is today, and, and I'll reemphasize the fact that it took a good 20 years of a, a, a solid foundational group of entrepreneurs to continually build things up to get to where we are today, where you know we're recognized and articles are written and people say they want to come to Boulder. Um, Techstars is huge. Uh, Techstars really put us on the map and it gave a reason for entrepreneurs to come to Boulder and start a company and experience it and then want to stay. Uh, I've heard really good things about the brandery. It sounds like that's, that's one of the all-stars here, and I know they're part of the Global Accelerator Network, which is, is a good stamp of approval. So I think you know, just having an environment, and accelerators are a dime a dozen today. A lot of them are shitty. A lot of them are really good. Having a really good resource for entrepreneurs to come and have their company founded you know, our, our three co-founders were, th were from Southern California. They all three live in Southern California still today, but our company is based in Boulder. None of our, co none of our founders live there. Um, we're based there because we came there, the founders loved it, and our first investors invested only in Rocky Mountain region companies. So like, if we're gonna give you this money, you're gonna be based in Boulder. So we did that. At the same time, we have 45 people in Anaheim, California. We have 60, 70 people collectively in Boulder and Denver. We have a team in Providence, Rhode Island. We work with a team in Romania. My team is everywhere. Um, so they don't all have to stay there. Companies can come to Cincinnati, go to the brandery, go to whatever other accelerator they, they want to contribute, play their, play their role, and then leave. That's not a, it's not a bad thing. So really high quality accelerator that attracts companies for some amount of time is one thing. Another thing is just constant efforts to do something new. The ability or the, the willingness to recognize when that something new is good or when it sucks and the willingness to let it go when it sucks, when it's not working. So, you know, trying out new events. When I started Boulder Beta, I, walk, I went around to everyone that I knew that I trusted and respected in Boulder and said, hey, Andrew Hyde, who's been a huge part of this community, does events all the time, you know, he's well known, well respected, really the, one of the really piece, uh, strong pieces of glue within Boulder, he's leaving. And I knew that that was gonna leave a gap. And at that point, I had been in Boulder for three years and had gotten a lot. And I wanted to, do my part to, to make things better. So I went out and I asked people like, what do we need? Do we need another event? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Well, here's what I'm thinking, what do you think? A lot of people told me like, no, it's gonna flop and we don't need another event and try something else. I said, well, this is what I'm gonna do. If it flops, it flops and I'll try something different. It didn't flop, it was a success, it keeps going, it might, not keep going next year, and it, and it might. And there are events that pop up all the time that happen for one or two months and then never happen again because people just weren't digging it. But that's okay. And those organizers, you know, can go off and contribute in some other way. So constantly iterating, trying new things, being willing to fail at those things and trying something else whenever failure occurs, just like the startup life, just like you know, trying to start a business or build a product is, is another big thing. Um, and also just not, uh, the fi a final thing is, is not getting too hung up on what's here physically. Um, a lot of things, that, a lot of complaints, one of the biggest complaints about Boulder is there's no capital. And companies in Boulder can't get money because there's only one VC firm and 
they, don't, they have silos that they invest in, so we can't get money. That's bullshit. Money's everywhere. And you don't have to take money from somewhere within a certain radius, mileage radius of, of where you're based. If you're good enough and you're building a product that solves a problem that people are willing to pay for, some investor somewhere is gonna give you money. So making excuses and feeling sorry is definitely not the way forward. And realizing that there are resources that can help a community from outside of a community, geographically speaking, is really important, is, is critical. So um, to recap, I think, you know, constant iteration on events, um, not focusing too much on what's here and, and what's not, just making sure that you're focusing on what's, in, what's within your control and do the best you can along those lines. Uh, and then I forgot what my third, my first point was, but it's on video, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe one more, anybody? Karen, are you raising your hand? You're stretching. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks again, Tim. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs>